Welcome to an ACRO webinar. I am uh, Jessica Schuster, one of the scientific planning uh, committee members and a member of ACRO for many years. And I have the privilege uh, to introduce a great topic of integrative uh, oncology. And we have a full panel of experts. I am currently working in the uh, Veterans Affairs System and at a recent uh, Astro uh, meeting, an ACRO meeting, had a chance to chat uh, casually with Dr. Reddy and um, have listened to several of his group's um, webinars on topics that I think all of us are very interested in, in kind of integrative uh, medicine, kind of the the medicine adjacent topics. And so, um, Dr. Reddy, if you would kind of introduce to us briefly um, kind of your organization and then um, our speakers, that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Jessica, for uh, for inviting us to join you today. And we're grateful to you and ACRO for introducing the topic to our radiation oncology community. Uh, my name is Manoj Reddy. I'm a radiation oncologist in Dallas. Um, I've had a career interest in um, patient-centered care, uh, quality of care, which eventually led to an interest in integrative medicine and integrative oncology. I um, did additional training at uh, University of Arizona's Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, and uh, then uh, after that, uh, Create, uh, out of uh, interest to create a community and networking and to learn more from my peers, I created the, uh, a group called the Integrative Oncology Working Group, which is a community of cancer care providers trained and or have long-term experience in integrative oncology. Our mission is to advance patient-centered evidence-based integrative oncology modalities. Uh, through education, awareness, collaboration, shared learning. We host bi-monthly webinars on a variety of integrative oncology topics and invite the entire ACRO community. These uh, meetings are free um, uh, and a website is, is forthcoming. We do have a Twitter and uh, LinkedIn handle that, that one could follow. And we do send our meeting uh, updates to the ACRO um, a week, a monthly newsletter as well as on the website. So thank you for having us. Joined uh, with me today are Dr. Beth Dupree. She's from Sedona, Arizona. She's a breast cancer surgeon, a board certified, board certified in surgery and integrated medicine, a former adjunct professor, University of Pennsylvania, author of The Healing Consciousness, A Doctor's Journey to Healing, She's a sought-after keynote speaker featured in the documentary Healthcare Cure and medical director of Gateway Sciences, amongst many other organizations. Also, Dr. Omer Kusik, who's uh, from Atlanta, Georgia. He is a board-certified medical oncologist. He's professor and chair of genitourinary cancer at the Department of Hematology and Oncology at Emory University. Dr. Kusik's major interest is in nutrition and cancer prevention with preclinical and clinical studies in soy, isoflavanes, and lycopene, and also includes physical activity, meditation, and yoga. He has over 200 peer-reviewed publications. In addition, we have Dr. Brian Lawanda from um, Kennewick, uh, Washington. He's a board-certified radiation oncologist, certified in medical acupuncture, and is national director of integrative oncology and cancer survivorship for Genesis Care. Dr. Luanda launched Integrative Oncology Essentials in 2009, a program for news and resource for patients in integrative oncology. He's the author of Empowering Against Cancer and a new upcoming book on functional medicine for oncology patients. Also, Dr. Biljeet Singh is from Chesapeake, Virginia. She's a board certified integrative oncology, uh, sorry, integrative gynecology oncologist a graduate of the prestigious MD Anderson Fellowship in Gynecology and Oncology, holds a doctoral degree in public health on cost analysis from University of Texas, and fellowship trained in integrative medicine also from the University of Arizona. She practices at Virginia Oncology Associates, U U.S. Oncology. She's a strong women's health advocate and on the med medical advisory board for Bright Pink and Facing Our Cancer Risk Empowered. 
on the board of directors for Physicians for a National Healthcare Program. Um, so I'm thankful to, to the group, uh, for our uh, group of leaders for joining us. Uh, these are members of uh, our, our, our group of 100 or more cancer care providers uh, from the United States and nine countries around the world who represent the Innovative Oncology Working Group. It's a growing group formed in 2000. So Jessica, we'll leave it up to you to ask us questions now. Fantastic. So Dr. Reddy, you know, sometimes I go jogging in my spare time. You create brand new working groups um, with high patient interest. So uh, I feel like those uh, and our experts um, from book writing to research projects and keynote speaking kind of keep you guys all very busy. I did want to um, just make sure that we highlighted for our listeners um, kind of that uh, kind of how this group kind of initially formed Dr. Reddy. So this very first question is for you. And then um, exactly how people kind of after today could get um, additional information. Yeah, um, I, uh, as I said, I had I have an interest in quality of care and patient-centered care that eventually led to me learning about integrative um, medicine, integrative oncology. Brian's website is something I ran into about 11 years ago. I also um, read the book from Dr. Donald Abrams on integrative oncology. It's a textbook book available on Amazon. Um, and in doing so, I learned about holistic care, something that I, you know, uh, uh, in, in my desire to provide uh, a patient-centered Care. And often our patients ask us, you know, how can I help our, myself, you know, they could, uh, with the interest of self-control and c controlling their cancer diagnosis and having some ability to have control. They, and they ask questions about supplements and exercise and nutrition, answers that we are often not, or questions that we don't have answers for because we're not taught that in medical school, you know, often. Uh, the curriculum is changing, but when I went to medical school, this was not offered to us. Uh, you know, extensively. So out of interest for that, I, uh, and I uh, joined a program, a fellowship program. It's a distance learning fellowship program um, from the University of Arizona it's at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, and Dr. Singh also graduated from the same program. Uh, it's there that I learned about integrative medicine, but how to implement that in, in cancer patients was still difficult. And so I wanted to create a community to um, join forces with, to network with, to ask questions. And, and then we began, then I uh, asked a group of friends in 2020 to meet together virtually uh, to discuss topics. It was quarterly discussions that eventually led to a 10 of us telling their friends and them telling their friends. And we, you know, uh, it gradually grew into about a, uh, now 100, 100 um, physicians, clinicians, um, nurses, nurse practitioners, yoga therapists, um, and psycho-oncologists, many aspects of cancer care, uh, you know, along with our conventional treatments that could be helpful to our patients in an evidence-based manner. Uh, we, like I said, we um, then created uh, bi-monthly meetings and uh, educational meetings. Um, we're creating a website to create a forum for us to discuss these topics to improve care. And at this point, uh, the best way to um, reach uh, the, the list is we're putting them on Twitter and LinkedIn. ACRO website will also have these uh, listings of our um, meetings. And also you could email me at manojmanoj at iowg.org to be added to the email list, I'd be happy to. And like I said, the meetings are free on a variety of topics. Fantastic. And uh, for our um, experts, I think it would be wonderful if there's any additional highlights uh, that you would like to say um, you know, about yourself, but also just kind of what made you interested in the topic or what was it that you felt was um, missing that uh, from your practice that led you to kind of pursue integrative 
uh, medicine? I, as a breast cancer surgeon for years, I mean, I, we are all trained in our um, specific field, surgery, oncology, radiation oncology, on how to treat the actual disease, which I consider the seed. And what integrative oncology does is it really looks at the soil. It looks at the whole, the person as a whole, their whole environment, how they eat, how they exercise, how they stress, how they sleep. And to be able to bring um, integrative care into cancer care, I've been really interested in integrative medicine for many, many years. It's been over 20 years. Um, have done, you know, got, I was kind of grandfathered into being um, board certified in integrative medicine because there were no programs back when I started doing this. And I was kind of out on a limb with my surgical colleagues um, through the American Society of Breast Surgeons. I gave a lecture, I believe it was in 2003 at our national conference on integrative care of our patients. And what was amazing was how many of my colleagues came up to me afterwards and says, oh my God, I'm so glad you brought this up. We need to talk about these topics. And now colleagues of mine like Jay Harness is spending the rest of his career um, working in the field of exercise oncology, looking at the, you know, and we've now been able to take our science of how we treat the physical body, continue to treat our patients with state-of-the-art cutting-edge Western medicine, but in every subspecialty, surgery, radiation, and and, you know, medical oncology, we're able to take a page out of the playbook of how do we how do we go back and help our patients to make the soil of their bodies like their envi- their micro environment their macro environment of their bodies be less desirable for a cancer cell to want to live or grow again and that to me is the greatest gift of this working group is that we have subspecialists across the board who are passionate about not just treating a disease but actually empowering our patients to live the healthiest life possible. And in the process, we're also affecting the potential downstream issues such as cardiovascular disease, which is a huge risk for my breast cancer patients 10 years out, very often much more than their breast cancer risk. So that was my reason for wanting to do this. And one more little thing, because while I have your attention, um, I have gotten certified in the past two years in psychedelic therapy because the utilization of the potentials for plant medicine and oncology care um, has been really um, spearheaded by my colleagues at NYU and at Johns Hopkins. But I feel like there's a place for that as a part of how we treat the whole person in cancer care. And uh, Omir, we'll have you go next. I'm a medical oncologist as as Manoj introduced. uh, the, the way I got into integrated medicine is through prevention. Uh, uh, back from my days uh, at Northwestern as a medical oncology fellow, uh, I started studying oxidative stress. And one thing led to another. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the chronic diseases, including cancer, is due to oxidative stress and inflammation. So that takes you immediately to how can we prevent it? So uh, obviously that takes you to nutrition, diet, botanicals. And later on now we learn that stress can also cause, psychological stress can cause oxidative stress and inflammation as proven. So that completes the, the whole ring, you know, uh, so it took me to cancer prevention through uh, botanicals and micronutrients. But uh, as, as you study these things, eventually, inevitably, it affects your practice. So you start approaching every single patient the same way. So now I cannot think of approaching patients any other way uh, other than integrative approach, a holistic approach, because every single patient deserves it. And it's easy to do. You don't have to spend a lot of time. It's easy to, to talk to the patient about uh, physical activity, exercise, diet, uh, body weight, uh, and uh, stress reduction. 
within a few minutes, you can give that message. If you have, even if you have no time in one minute, you can tell the patient, walk more, eat less, don't stress. It mm -hmm. takes less than 30 seconds to say. And guess what? Patients take that very seriously. If it comes from their doctor and they trust their doctor, of course, number one thing is you approach your patients like your family and you treat them like your family and you have their full attention and full confidence and full trust. And you can, uh, if you tell them to lose weight, they lose weight. At, uh, a month later, two months later, they come and tell you, this is how much weight I lost. This is how much I walk. This is what I eat, etc." So I think uh, basically I, I try to simplify it for patients so that they can use it in their lives. I can, I try to make it very simple very easy to remember and doable and sustainable. Uh, if you tell them to do something and if you uh, confuse them, give them a lot of unnecessary information, they're not gonna remember it. And they're not gonna do it. So, and repetition is also important. Every single time I see a patient every two weeks or every three weeks when they come for their chemotherapy or hormone therapy, no matter what patients, you know, my practice is mostly prostate cancer. Uh, every time I see them, I, I pretty much give them the same message. And, and they never get tired of hearing it. I never get tired of saying it because it's the right thing to do. It's prevention of disease, prevention of side effects if they are getting chemotherapy or hormone therapy or radiation therapy. First, I emphasize that almost all of the side effects are preventable and there are ways to prevent them. Even if you can't com completely prevent them, you can reduce them. So they can have less fatigue, less uh, weight gain, less muscle loss, less cognitive decline, less cardiovascular problems. And I tell them things that they can do uh, eat a lot of vegetables, stay away from sugar and alcohol, everything in moderation. And I also, being a prostate cancer oncologist, I talk about lycopene, of course, eat a lot of tomatoes. But if you want to take some lycopene capsules, go ahead. It's over the counter, it's available because uh, I have a lot of experience with lycopene. I, I have published a lot of papers on that, that uh, it reduces uh, PSA. There's also some evidence that it may prevent some of the side effects of treatment. So uh, basically, uh, I came from the angle of uh, cancer prevention. That's what they let it, what led me to integrative medicine. And to me, integrative medicine is what I spend, what I do every day with every single patient. I don't have to you know, it's really integrated. I, it's uh, to me, all medicine is integrated medicine. Everything we do, uh, you know, in addition to their chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and radiation therapy, everything else we do is integrated medicine. So uh, maybe I'll stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, we'll move on with our introductions and just a quick. Um, reminder, kind of the, the question was kind of what made you interested in, um, why did, why did you feel like integrative medicine, uh, was important, uh, it, kind of in your uh, career? Well, nothing made me interested in integrative medicine. Integrative medicine happened to me and I happened to integrative medicine. We became one because to me, this is healthy lifestyle. That's what integrative medicine is. Physical activity, healthy diet, and stress reduction. We have to do all of these things. We have to do it. Patients have to do it. Everybody has to do it. That's the only way to live a healthy life. There is no other way. So when you tell your patients, you know, <laughs> explain it in a very common sense, very simple way. They say, yes, that you're right, and we'll do it. So 
increase physical activity, decrease, uh, you know, Americans uh, consume too many calories. We, we can all reduce our uh, size of our uh, uh, plate and uh, eat less because we eat far too much. And, uh, uh, you know, have a healthy body weight and, and do, do our 30 minutes of walking a, a daily. It's easy to do, it's not difficult to do. If you walk five minutes every hour in six hours, you got your 30 minutes. So you have to tell them things, things that are easy for them to do, that's practical. They don't have to go out and go to a gym or et cetera. They can do it at home. They, can, they, can, they don't have to leave the room and they can get that 30 minutes of exercise in their room and they just have to watch what they eat, uh, eat you know, basically a more vegetable-based diet and try to avoid uh, sugar, cakes, pies, cookies, candies, that sort of stuff. And that's, patients know that, they understand that. They know all of these things. You, you're just telling them, you know, every time you tell them, it gets more ingrained and, and, and then they start doing it and then they see results and then they're proud of themselves. And they love you. They know that you're working for them. They, you want the, uh, they know that uh, you, you want their, uh, them to be healthy and your treatment side effects to be less. And uh, uh, they, they know that and they, they trust you. And uh, it's not difficult to do that. It doesn't take much time either. I hear a lot of people saying that it takes too much time, you know, to talk about diet and exercise. No, it doesn't. You can give that message in less than one minute. Excellent. I'm going to have uh, our move on to our other uh, panel experts so they have a chance to introduce themselves and their uh, experience. So uh, this is uh, Brian Lawenda, uh, radiation oncologist in uh, Kennewick, Washington, and integrative oncologist. Uh, I got into uh, integrative oncology uh, really through my patients. Uh, they are often the inspiration for a lot of things that, that we do. Uh, and for me, it was, uh, you know, while I was in my residency uh, at Mass General, I had a lot of patients who were taking supplements, as many people do. And so, some of the recommendations that we have is, you know, that as the uh, either the residents or the attending physicians are, for example, not to take antioxidant uh, supplements during their chemo and radiation therapy. And I wondered where that evidence came from. And I asked my professors and, you know, they, they basically said, well, you know, there's theoretical interactions that could in interfere with, uh, you know, the oxidative damage that we're trying to cause from uh, chemo and radiation and, and thus potentially reduce the efficacy of treatments. And uh, so uh, my residency research project that I, that I did was actually on hundreds of mice, uh, feeding them a, a diet of, of uh, either vitamin E enhanced uh, mouse chow or EGCG, which is a green tea extract enhanced mouse chow or just regular mouse chow, and uh, did a, a special type of you know, radiobiology assay, the TCB50 assay. Uh, to look to see, you know, if there was any reduction in efficacy of the radiation. And as it turned out, there was no reduction. And there was a protection of normal tissues that was very robust. And uh, that that launched my interest uh, further publishing that information, presenting it at the Society for Integrative Oncology, which then introduced me uh, in the early 2000s to the Society for Integrative Oncology, a fantastic uh, group. Uh, you know, of, of academics and, and private, uh, you know, uh, practice providers of all, all different types, uh, which is really where I got most of my uh, basic uh, integrative oncology uh, background from, was from SIO and going to conferences and listening to lectures. Um, I had a mentor in radiation oncology who also was an acupuncturist, and so I decided to follow in his footsteps and and uh, went through the Helms Medical Acupuncture course and, and, and uh, started to do research studies uh, in acupuncture with one of the uh, graduate programs in acupuncture and where I was living in San Diego. And uh, we, we uh, you know, basically created a, a sham needle device where we could uh, test uh, whether or not acupuncture was more placebo or, or sham, which was a big question that I, I had.
had. Uh, and so, you know, basically one thing led to another. I then got involved in uh, functional medicine. I thought that that was fascinating, which is the use of lab uh, assays to look at underlying physiology, like nutrients and gut health and HPA axis and metabolic health. And being able to look at all of these things, as as uh, uh, Beth uh, Dupree had mentioned, uh, you know that there is this whole system that we're trying to approach. Uh, and uh, you know, I have a uh, a big interest in in, in whole systems uh, design in terms of on the engineering side. And so I looked at uh, how uh, the whole system of you know various important aspects of the body interact with each other. They all communicate. And they communicate with our environment. They communicate with our treatments. They can, they, they uh, interact with our genetics, uh, a variety of other uh, variables. And so this just made me incredibly interested in this topic. Um, I kept on going on it, and I've never stopped. And now I just educate about it, and I, you know, do that with either uh, healthcare providers or, um, you know, or my patients in my radiation oncology practice on a day to day basis. All right, and Dr. Singh, clo close us out. Oh, um, sorry, I feel like we skipped Manoj, but I'm happy to talk. Um, so I'm just going to agree with my colleagues. Uh, you know, I'll agree with Omar that I went to med school with a belief in cancer prevention, and that made me interested in things. And I'm going to really strongly like second what Brian said. I, I ultimately did my fellowship because my patients made me. You know, they would come in and ask me questions about herbs, about massage, about acupuncture. And at some point, you know, the, the thing that I learned <laughs> during my training was, well, if we don't understand it, we say no. And at some point, right, you just have to stop doing that and say, but we can learn about it. We can understand it. Um, and then uh, I will say, you know, the Integrative Medicine Fellowship at um, the University of Arizona is just an amazing experience as a healthcare provider, you know, I have a background in policy and, and systems and thinking about how our healthcare is organized and paid for. And it's organized and paid for in a way that doesn't encourage us to see whole patients. And it doesn't encourage us to help patients heal themselves. And the entire Integrative Medicine Fellowship for me was a reminder of those two things. Right. Number one, we really support people. We give them tools, but ultimately they cure their own cancers. And if we don't use every tool available to us, we're doing them a disservice. And so to me, that's a big piece of what we do. And then the other piece is, you know, not focusing only on the disease, but how they got there, you know, what was in their lifestyle that led them to have that and how can we help them work on that to help them not only treat their cancer, but improve their life overall. And again, it's one of the things I love about this working group that Manoj evolved, um, because in a way like oncology is not the center of, of the fellowship, obviously, um, and to have a group where we can think and talk and people ask questions, um, narrow questions, huge questions, and you know, you get people who are are active and working and doing and thinking and reading and researching and practicing. You know, everybody in the same group answering these questions to help our patients heal themselves. I mean, I think that's ultimately what we do. And you know, in a way, integrative medicine is really different than regular medicine. And in many ways, it's it's what regular medicine should be. And somehow we lost it um, and we sold it away and we gave it away to other people. We just have to get it back. <laughs> um, and I do feel like, you know, at least while I was part of the med school and as I uh, faculty at Northwestern and now as you look across like the number of integrated medicine training programs, it feels like that's coming true also. That, you know, we're coming back to where it's not this little fringe thing happening on the side, but it's a part of every patient's care and every, you know, practitioner's training. No, I think that uh, is so well uh, summarized, even as someone who kind of has just some fringe interest 
it is uh, for sure always on the patient's mind, no matter, you know, very highly educated and, uh, you know, maybe low health literacy, both groups have an interest in what else can I, uh, what else can I do? Um, maybe briefly in like a one or two liner, um, we'll go around again, kind of in that uh, alphabetical order. And this time we'll uh, swing back with you, Dr. Reddy, as well. Um, what what does your practice look like for integrative medicine? Um, do you have separate visits? How much time would you say is your primary oncology role versus the integrative medicine? Um, and uh, Dr. Dupree, we'll start with you again. I had to walk away from the loud noise. I stepped outside of my car because it's such a beautiful day. I decided to bathe in nature. Um, from, from a practical perspective, it's not a separate appointment. Um, the integrative oncology approach begins at the time of diagnosis for me. When I sit down with my patients, I start out their list. I, I have a paper that I give them that has their breast cancer diagnosis, the TNM stage, what, their, um, what type of cancer they have. And then I divide it into um, local treatment, systemic treatment. Local treatments, what I do as a surgeon, systemic treatment starts with BMI, um, alcohol consumption, like everything on my list of exercise, alcohol, nutrition, um, all the things that they can do in their lifestyle. And I always talk to my patients about, you know, we all have opportunities for improvement um, in our lives. And I don't talk, I don't tell a patient, hey, I, you're, you're too fat. I say, listen, your height's a little bit too short for your weight. So either we need you to grow an inch or two, or we've got to work on that. And by approaching um, you know, what I've heard from my patients and the reason why they are very motivated to make changes in their lifestyle is they go, I was diagnosed with cancer. I think I'm going to die. And you spent the first 15 minutes of our consult talking to me about lifestyle modification and things that I could do to address my stress, to address my exercise, to address my nutrition. And it made me think, what the heck I'm going to live. Like I, if you're, if you're telling me about this, you believe that I'm going to survive this cancer. And that mindset in and of itself sets the intention for that person that, yeah, you have a cancer, but let's look at the bigger picture of how are you going to live the rest of your life? Because I'm going to be part of this. And I believe that from the time that I started doing that about 15 years ago, it changed my patient's perspective because they recognized that I was spending time investing in their overall health and well-being from a long term and not just diving into what kind of surgery they need, what kind of chemo or radiation I think they should get. And that is, you know, we, we got really good at treating, you know, we, Western medicine got so focused on um, treating diseases that we forgot about prevention. We forgot about the fact that most chronic disease can be addressed with lifestyle, with education about nutrition and exercise and stress management. Acute diseases like a ruptured spleen, you know, no one's diet's going to stop their spleen from bleeding. It's going to be me open their belly, taking their spleen out as a surgeon, but um, from because cancer is one of the big chronic diseases, we need to approach it as such by, I say, making an integrative approach from the get-go with a patient because you set that intention. That's my approach. And then I keep reminding them. What a kind of a, a wonderful way to flip their concerns very early on in that uh, conversation. And um, We'll go ahead and uh, I know um, that we had a brief introduction um, with how you say that it's got to be part of every single uh, visit, but um, go ahead and kind of show tell us a little bit about how uh, integrative medicine plays into your uh, practice. Oh. Sorry, Omir, I don't know if you heard me call call, okay. call your Sorry. name. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, as I said earlier, I I, uh, I totally agree with uh, Beth, Brian, Diljeet, and Manoj. Uh, the, the approach is pretty much same. You know, uh, I, I approach the patient the same, uh, same way and basically uh, an integrative approach and uh, I start talking to the patient about diet and exercise, and they forget about their cancer. And uh, 
you know, we're talking about, uh, they start thinking about what, what they're going to do 10 years later. They're, they're not uh, thinking that they're going to be dead next year. So they, they appreciate the fact that you're, you're taking a totally different approach. And one time I had a 92 year old patient came to me and I started talking to him about exercise. And at the end of the uh, consultation, he said, doctor, uh, I'm 92. You're the first doctor ever talk to me about exercise and I'm 92 years old. And so that's how much I believe in this. I believe that uh, there's an exercise form of physical activity that anybody can do. Doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. I, I keep hammering this point to every patient. You have to use your muscles. You have to do physical activity. The more, the better. And you have to eat right. You have to eat healthy. You know what that is. And try to reduce stress. And there are many ways of reducing stress. You want to do meditation, yoga, tai chi, uh, music, uh, walking in nature, uh, whatever works for you, whatever is available. Uh, there are many ways of reducing stress. But basically, it all boils down to those three things, right? Physical activity, healthy diet and, and stress reduction. And uh, patients will benefit from that regardless, no matter what stage their cancer is at. Of course, we, 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 we give whatever treatment they need, whether they need hormone therapy, radiation therapy, they need surgery, they need chemotherapy or immunotherapy, they all get that. Uh, we, of course, we talk a little bit about that too. But uh, to me, an integrative approach is is essential for every patient because it makes them feel good, makes them optimistic, gives them hope. Uh, it makes them feel better and their quality of life improves. And there are many ways of reducing side effects of treatment. Uh, so I won't go into any detail here, but there, there are so many things you can do and the patients I'm going to ask for some low-hanging fruit as a general oncologist here in a second. <laughs> well, one of my favorite things is soy milk. I say drink soy milk, especially if you have breast cancer, because data shows that women who have breast cancer, who continue to consume soy products, they live 20% longer. Uh, this may come as a surprise to some, but... Uh, uh, because a lot of oncologists tell their patients, no, stay away from soy, especially if you have breast cancer. It's just the opposite. Mm. So that's one thing that I want to leave you with. Oh, great. Dr. Lawinda, uh, how does your practice look for um, integrative medicine? So I, I also incorporate it into the individual oncology visits. Um, you know, sometimes it's just an introduction. Uh, at the end, for me, it's at the end of the of the encounter. If we have time, um, sometimes there, you know, oftentimes there really isn't a lot of time. You spend so much time talking about the conventional oncological stuff uh, that you really need to have a separate appointment. But I'll throw in some, uh, you know, some points about nutrition because it's usually the first thing that people want to know, uh, or maybe it's skincare uh, as it pertains to radiation oncology. Um, you know, just really just quick bites of, in, of stuff that might be of interest to people or if they're having a side effect or symptom that maybe, you know, we can either manage with, you know, pharmaceutical drugs or some other type of complementary therapy, we might quickly go into that. But otherwise, I'll usually um, reserve it for a future appointment. I will put a placeholder in there, meaning I'll actually tell the patient that I'd like to get back to some of these things with them on a future appointment that today may not be the best time, just uh, due to the limitations of our time, due to I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information right now. Um, but there's a whole bunch of, of stuff that we can talk about that might be of interest to you. And this pertains to you know, all the different things that we've already mentioned here today, including uh, you know, also my, my interest in functional medicine testing for them, just to let them know that this is something that we can do uh, at a future appointment. And, um, and, and oftentimes I'll be scheduling a you know, future appointment with them if they, if they express interest 
uh, in it. If they're if they don't bite and there really isn't a whole lot of interest, then uh, then then usually it's kind of the end of it, you know, uh, for you know for me on that. You know, I might still try to throw some of those other you know easy things, you know, uh, you know, sort of the global topics that we all know about, you know, stress, uh, you know, exercise and food topics. But other than that, I may not dive deeply into anything else just based on my perception of what I'm getting from the patient after each individual encounter. No, I think you uh, definitely hit one of the listeners concerns of like, I just spent an hour and a half talking through intermediate risk prostate cancer with this gentleman as a radiation oncologist because there's about 800 ways not to treat it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and picking, picking by the time you pick, you're like, oh man, I don't have time to talk about anything else. Um, so I feel, I feel like that's a very practical approach of, hey, we may not have time to get into some additional things, but I'm sure these things will come up on your mind or your family's mind. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Dr. Reddy, how do you integrate uh, kind of the integrative component into your uh, practice? First of all, I want to say, um, as you could see, this panel is like, you know, they're experts in their fields and integrative oncology, and I really thank them for joining us. I mean, from all the answers, you could see how well-rounded they are. Um, one... Um, I think first I start with listening, you know, listening to the patient. That's how I ventured into integrative oncology. And I, you know, you kind of meet them where they're at, you know, uh, when you, uh, depending on what the cancer site is, and you could add specifics um, as a radiation oncologist, you know, prostate cancer is one of our common areas. And, you know, one of the areas I focus on is exercise. I mean, Primarily because if you're on androgen deprivation, you're going to lose muscle mass. And it's really a, a key thing for them to know something that they can do and control. And if they're apt for doing so, um, it's really helpful to them that doesn't require a huge investment. Um, we go over side effects, um, you know, their, uh, their stressors. Uh, as, uh, and, and, you know, just listening to them and seeing where we could add integrative approaches. And then our on treatment visits is another opportunity for us to re-engage uh, for each time we see them. We, you know, we build this relationship. It doesn't happen immediately. It's a relationship that's built, I think. Um, and you know, and then you, you know, eventually when you're and you know, going into the follow-up stage, you're dealing with survivorship. It's beyond the treatment, and that's where they could focus more on how they could try to prevent the disease from coming back. And so I think it's a gradual sense of building the relationship with the patient and understanding their needs. And I see integrative oncology as being the best doctor that I could, you know, being the best provider of their care, not only, um, you know, in our knowing our radiation oncology really well, knowing our, you know, surgery really well, knowing our medical oncology really well, but in addition, being a whole person doctor, you know, and I, I do see that this should be a standard of care as everyone else pointed out we're passionate about this that you know that patients uh and ourselves you know our family what would we want for our family we would want the best care uh, and it doesn't always involve a medication or you know a certain treatment but you know it, it's guidance and and living a better life with 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 the help of activity nutrition um stress reduction uh you know sleeping better i mean and so this is another reason I would encourage everyone listening to join our meetings just to get a grasp of what we're talking about. If you, if you have interest and in, you can learn more about what this means. And I second uh, Diljeet in, in saying that, you know, the, the, the uh, Arizona Integrative Medicine Program was not just uh, for us to learn about patients, but for ourselves, it was a healing experience for us, for all of us that have been to, through that program. Uh, if you have an interest, I would encourage you to investigate that. Fantastic. And Dr. Singh. I, you know, this is a great thing about being at the end of the alphabet, you know, everybody else had great answers and I agree with them. Um, but I will say it's true. I mean, I think I do a little bit of what Beth does of you sneak it into your initial meeting where you're, you know, you're doing their initial intake history and you're asking about, you know, what do you do for exercise? And, you know, do you smoke, do you drink? And you just sort of weave some comments into that. 
Um, I weave it into my discussion as I'm talking about surgical risks and how we're going to minimize surgical risks. And so then I'll weave in like 30 minutes of walking or doing some pelvic floor stretches or whatever kind of I can weave into that conversation. Um, but I'm lucky enough, I have, you know, one, as everyone's talked about, we have longitudinal relationships with people so we can come back to things. But I also have the opportunity to do a separate integrative oncology consult where I have 30 minutes of time. So certainly for patients who wanna talk a little bit more, who wanna specifically talk about supplements or something else that um, I don't have time for or are not my individual you know, gynecologic oncology patients, I do that separately. Um, and, um, you know, they're, they're, they're different kinds of consultations and they're both very rewarding. And for patients who are pursuing more information, it's really nice to be able to have that opportunity to spend that little extra bit of time. And truthfully, like as a GYN oncologist, like, you know, like you guys are talking about when you're the primary person caring for the patient's cancer there is a little bit of interplay that happens between helping them with, you know, negotiate the Western modalities and make decisions and on and on and on. And that's a, you know, complete endeavor. Um, but there's something very nice about being able to be an integrative oncology consultant um, where you really can focus on everything else other than the cancer diagnosis. And there's an oncologist who's focused with um, them on that. So I really appreciate being able to play both roles in the organization that I'm a part of um, because um, absolutely, you know, I consider myself an integrative GYN oncologist, but even my own patients, I will sometimes self-refer to my own clinic just so we have a little extra time to go through some specifics that they have questions about that I don't always have time in my oncology schedule to do. Oh, thank you. That sounds very practical. Um, approaches from everybody's groups. And I certainly have gleaned a few little, even things you could take away um, today. I wanted to give um, Dr. Lawinda just a chance to talk about your separate visit in a little bit more detail, but wanted to prep our um, speakers that our next question um, it, you know, is not meant to call out uh, those of us that don't do integrative medicine, um, but kind of where is it that you guys see providers are the most lacking and kind of how do you see that kind of hurting uh, the patient care? Um, but Dr. Lawinda, kind of tell us a little bit about your secondary uh, visit. I'd love to hear more about kind of your functional medicine uh, visit. <clears throat> So uh, that visit is, you know, for people who are interested in, you know, possibly doing some lab testing or at least learning about it, that's what that visit is often uh, scheduled for. It could be 30 minutes, it can be an hour, it just depends on sort of the intensity of what we're going to be talking about. Um, if we're just simply looking at uh, something, for example, insulin resistance and how to mitigate insulin resistance, then that, that can be a fairly quick visit of 30 minutes, that's quick uh, in, you know, for an integrative oncology visit. Um, you know, reviewing uh, you know, hemoglobin A1C, insulin glucose response testing, uh, you know, looking at inflammation markers, possibly you know, doing some other uh, you know, testing, whether it be HPA axis testing to look at cortisol, uh, maybe looking at DEXA scan uh, information in terms of uh, visceral fat and, and you know, lean body mass, uh, trying to get a hold of somebody's, you know, sort of figure out what their, um, you know, their caloric intake is, uh, you know, how they respond to, uh, you know, carbo simple carbohydrates with a continuous glucose monitor or finger stick glucose testing. You know, so these are types of things that I might do and sort of drill down into and schedule, you know, a variety of different visits, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we might do a, a visit that's looking at uh, diet and specifically, you know, looking at nutrient deficiencies. So I might run a, a test such as the NutriVal test, which is a blood and urine assay um, that uh, gives us really in-depth information about all the patient's uh, micronutrients, uh, their protein levels, uh, oxidative stress, um, a variety of different uh, other markers. And so, you know, through that, then we can then customize uh, a diet discussion that's a little more apt, uh, that's specific for that patient, as opposed to the general advice of eat healthier. 
you know, and so, you know, that that's almost useless information, you know, so if we can kind of help them, okay, what does that actually mean as it pertains to you? Well, you, you, know, you don't have insulin resistance, we've checked that, but you've got all of these nutrient deficiencies and maybe you have gut microbiome dysbiosis because you were interested in having us test for that. We could see that you have that. You have intestinal permeability problems. So maybe there's some absorption issues or, or uh, you know, just not being able to metabolize and, and produce certain micronutrients very well. So we can then you know, make some more specific recommendations as it pertains to them and where maybe to you know, eat a whole food diet that's, that's more specific for those nutrients. And there's programs that I use, uh, that, that I, that I implement with patients on, on, uh, you know, uh, tracking of their own diet. Um, if we want to get into that, that's, that's something that we can do with apps, uh, there, you know, a diet, a, a diet tracking uh, with diaries. Um, and there's so much that we can do with, uh, with functional medicine that try to optimize overall, you know, health and potentially longevity as we talk as, was mentioned early on is cardiovascular disease is obviously a huge risk, um, as is dementia, uh, you know, diabetes and all of the, you know, the life shortening uh, complications from all of those. And these are all interrelated and functional medicine sort of sits right at the, the juncture point for us in, in medicine to try to look at some of these, uh, you know, underlying potential abnormalities that might have associations indirectly or directly with um, you know health outcomes, whether they be cancer outcomes or other chronic disease outcomes, so uh, it's fascinating for the patients who are you know, really want to dive deeper into this sort of thing. Uh, this is a teachable moment for a lot of people. Uh, you know, cancer survivorship, particularly, is an important component of of most of our practices. And so, you know, as part of cancer survivorship, I think you know we we owe it to our patients. Um, you know, to try to, you know, help them get onto a better path towards longevity and health and quality of life. Thank you for that uh, kind of a little bit deeper, deeper dive there. So uh, Dr. Dupree kind of headed back to you, kind of the um, question being kind of the, um, what do you think's lacking in kind of the oncology practices generally, and, you know, kind of how you see that as a harm um, you know, kind of potentially for patients. Unfortunately, I've, I've been in too many, too, around too many oncology practices where I'll walk into an infusion room and there is a table full of cookies and pastries and stuff that people, you know, that the, the talk was always, well, you know, just let the patients eat whatever they want during chemotherapy. And I think that's like the worst thing we can do for our patients. We need to teach our patients about caloric restriction and you're not going to starve to death during chemo, but cancer cells love sugar. I'm sorry. And so the whole idea of um, feeding a cancer through an oncology office by giving sweets and treats um, doesn't sit really well with me. Um, and I think that uh, for a lot of my colleagues, I, I have to say my radiation therapy colleagues were the first ones to get on the bus and actually brought the data to me about using um, American ginseng to decrease fatigue. Like this was many, many years ago. And I loved it because they, they already knew where I was in this process. And I think that what's lacking is just an overall connection between physicians to understand that it's not just our job to treat the cancer with each modality, but it's our job to treat the whole person. And that's what I'd like to see happen. And Dr. Kutrick, uh, kind of where do you see... Uh, they're being lacking and, and potential harms to patients. I, I totally agree with Beth. And uh, what, what I see is that the, the real way of approaching the patients is the holistic approach with healthy living, uh, both during cancer treatment and in survivorship. Uh, I think that's the direction that the entire medicine, the entire field of medicine is going. Eventually, uh, we will only teach integrative medicine in medical schools. Every single medical school in the world will be teaching integrative medicine because that's the only common sense approach. And unfortunately, you know, now that, uh, right now, 
the physicians who are in practice, they have not uh, been educated like that in medical school. Uh, the physicians, uh, they are taught how to make a diagnosis and how to give a, a medication or order a test. Uh, they are treating the disease, not the person. I think uh, the main thing is to approach the entire person, both physically and mentally and psychologically and socially, uh, talk about the complete health and a holistic approach. And that's what's lacking. And, and, the, and it's very easy to do, but since uh, medical schools don't teach that, uh, and the medical students and residents and fellows don't learn that, it's not easy for them to make that on their own, to learn it on their own. And it's, it's like uh, some, some, they have to follow somebody who's doing it to learn it. And it starts at the medical school level. And even earlier, we had to teach healthy living, even at the grammar school level and middle school and high school and college, not just uh, in the clinic to our patients. So I think it's, there has to be a whole change in the attitude of, of the health system of the entire world. Uh, how, to, how we teach medicine and how we practice medicine, how we approach uh, humans and how to, to try to improve the lives of, of people through integrative health. Instead of calling it medicine, we can call it integrative health. And, and the main components of that is known to everybody here, physical activity, healthy diet, stress reduction are the main components. And I think, I think we can do it. Uh, we are just starting this. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a lot of interest around the world in integrative medicine. And, and doctors are, are gradually uh, gravitating towards uh, this approach because it makes sense. It's common sense approach. And uh, yeah, uh, and we can only educate our colleagues, uh, you know, through conferences, through uh, meetings like uh, Manoj's group, Integrative Oncology Working Group, and Society of Integrative Oncology, and uh, Consortium of Academic Centers of Integrative Medicine, and so forth. And NIH has a lot of money for this kind of research. We need to continue to do research to provide the scientific basis of everything we do. Like Brian is doing with his testing of insulin resistance and inflammation and oxidative stress and nutritional deficiencies and DEXA scans for uh, body composition and so forth. I think that needs to be incorporated into our approach. Excellent. And uh, Dr. Lowinda, um, some thoughts on what you think people are missing? I know you practice in a large group. Um, so I imagine maybe you get questions from your colleagues and get a, get a chance to see uh, scenario, you know, a lot of different patient scenarios. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would just basically say that, you know, we, you know, kind of bringing back to what we started with is, you know, our patients direct us, uh, you know, to learn this stuff. And that's really, I think, what most of, you know, my colleagues that I work with, they, they come to me with questions that their patients are asking them. Uh, you know, they'll ask me, what do I think about IV vitamin C or what do I think about, you know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy or, you know, you name it. Uh, and so these are questions that, you know, are, are based upon things that our patients are doing uh, that we really don't get a lot of training, uh, you know, in our, you know, conventional medical training. And, and so I, I think, you know, a lot of these resources that we've already, you know, uh, 
touched on, you know, are places for, for us who are interested in learning more, uh, you know, can go to to learn more about these modalities and lifestyle, uh, you know, modifications and counseling, et cetera. Um, so uh, I, I think that more, uh, you know, more knowledge of, uh, you know, the Integrative Oncology Working Group and SIO, um, you know, I think that would be something that, you know, would be, uh, you know, thanks to a podcast like this, we're going to have more, more people, I think, becoming aware and people who are interested in uh, you know, being able to you know, learn more about these topics, I think they should seriously consider uh, you know, membership or, or looking into uh, these organizations for enhancing their knowledge base. I'm gonna task you on your website, you know, so those of us that wanna just peruse and dabble, uh, there's some you know, low hanging fruit there for us to <laughs> pull into our practice. Uh, Dr. Um, since we are running into our time, um, I think this just highlights that you'll probably just have to have another webinar. Um, so put pencil us in. Um, but in our last couple of uh, moments, Dr. Reddy and Dr. Singh, same question to you guys. You're, um, please feel free, Dr. Reddy, you go, you'll go first. But also be thinking of kind of just a final comment of there was one low hanging fruit or tip or supplement that you're like, man, this really has changed my practice. That would be um, fantastic. So Dr. Reddy, we'll start with you. And then Dr. Singh plan to finish. And then our other two uh, experts that are still with us, um, please feel free to add your one last line if you like. <clears throat> sure, um, well, sorry, how do I second what everyone else has said? <laughs> Basically, you know, I, I would uh, second every, everything everyone said. I think um, philosophically, we don't look at patients as a whole perspective. It's just not what we're taught in, in our current medical programs. As a former uh, program director of radiation oncology, our focus is really training our residents in our complicated treatments of you know oncology, and it becomes ever more complicated. So um, I, I think we need to change our educational system. To some extent, a lot of schools are going towards that. Um, and even in our residency training, including how do we incorporate the whole body ex experience for these patients? Because it's not just about their disease, but the whole person. And if we start incorporating that, I think it would be helpful to them uh, and also a great learning experience for our residents. Um, and there is a program that's doing that at the University of Arizona and uh, Mayo Clinic in Arizona where they've integrated um, uh, their hematology oncology program with integrative medicine. Um, and I think more programs could look at, at changing the educational phil philosophical direction. Where we're looking at the whole patient rather than just the disease because, you know, that, I mean, patients are not just their cancer, you know, and eventually, and more and more patients survive, we need to take care of the whole person. Um, as far as a low hanging fruit, exercise, exercise, exercise you know, uh, prescribe that to every patient, make sure that that's what, you know, I mean, if they could follow that, I mean, it helps in every way, cardiovascular, cancer, diabetes, you know, you name it, any chronic disease exercise would probably be the low-hanging fruit. Well, and I think Dr. Singh, you may be muted. I am. Um, you know, you know, what do I think all of us oncologists can do. I guess I, I totally agree with, with Manoj that like, you know, exercise is an easy thing to remind patients to do. Um, but I guess I would encourage everybody to maybe, you know, come up with a website or a link or something that you like for diet. I think the, you know, the eat a good diet line it doesn't serve patients and it's confusing, but, you know, anti-cancer living, that's a nice website, you know, based out of MD Anderson that has a lot of great stuff on all of these topics. It's very sensible. Look it up yourself, make sure you like it and then feel comfortable referring. And then a lot of times when patients ask questions about what to eat, you may feel like, oh, I don't know enough to say this, but how you answer the question, right? So if you sort of say, oh, it doesn't matter, just you know, don't lose weight during therapy, that's one way of thinking about it. But the other is to say, 
I know this nutritionist who knows a lot about this, or I know this integrative oncologist who knows a lot about this. I have a lot of faith in what they can tell you. It's really important that you meet with them, you know, and I set that up. And, you know, just in the way we talk about things, you know, if in, you know, like Beth was saying in the very first few minutes, she talks about diet and exercise and lifestyle. If, if you can just remember to like, keep those in your language. So you're not minimizing it. You're helping patients understand it's important. I guess I, I would support that. And then if we're like talking about pet peeves, like I think, you know, the instinct to just tell everybody to take a multivitamin and think that's going to like fix their dietary issues. Like I, I don't think it's legitimate. And there's a whole bunch of really crappy multivitamins that have all this synthetic vitamin A that acts as a differentiating agent, I would just resist the urge to put everybody on a, a multivitamin. Um, there's a bunch of not good ones out there and they're probably telling them to eat an apple every day would serve them more, right? So I guess I would encourage everybody like find some link that you can use in your patient education things, find some source you like um, and then make it as important as the other treatments you recommend. Um, and I guess I'd even make that my final thought, you know, that, you know, avail yourself of all the great resources, resources out there. You know, the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine has some, Andy Wiles, as I mentioned, I do love that anti-cancer living book, um, that the group out of Anderson did and, and their website's really nice and it's free for patients and, um, all the information's legit and reasonable. Um, so, and then thank you for all the oncologists and everybody else who took the time to listen to this podcast, right? We appreciate the interest and as an organization and as individuals, I think we're all open to um, being available to anybody who has questions or wants to have further discussions, whether it's about integrative G1 oncology or breast surgery or radonc or medonc, you know, I, I think there's people in our group who are willing to lend you expertise however we can. Thanks so much. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, yeah, the time went by, you know, even faster. And I just, I wanted everybody to have a chance to say kind of what they were passionate about because um, everyone is a slightly different uh, background. So hopefully everybody felt like they got their chance to have their spiel. <laughs>